Welcome back everybody. In this video, I'm going to review over the general acid ionization equation and how to determine the Ka expression, as well as how we will quantify how strong an acid is using pKa. So, the general acid ionization equation is HA, so that's how we represent a general acid here. There's that proton that will be donated. Remember, acids by the Brunsted Lowry definition are proton donors. We're in an aqueous solution, so you write water. In this case, I'm going to use the equilibria arrows if we're working with the weak acid here. And remember, since this is your acid. Water must be behaving as a what? A base, good. So, proton donor, proton acceptor. Knowing the definition will help us to predict the products correctly. So if this is losing its proton, then that means that we're left with A, and then not just a neutral charge, we've lost a positive charge, so A has a negative one. This is the conjugate base of our acid. Plus, if water has gained a proton, it goes from H2O to what? Good, H3O, which has a what formal charge? Plus one, that's the hydronium ion. The hydronium ion is the conjugate acid of water. So as I've said in previous videos, always use the definitions to help guide you to correctly predict the products of your chemical reaction that's taking place. Um, but overall, this is just the general acid ionization equation. You'll be writing it quite a bit when you're solving problems. Um, but if you ever get stuck, you can derive it based on your knowledge of those definitions. All right, so the Ka expression then would be the equilibrium constant, and that's products over reactants. So the concentration of the conjugate base times the concentration of the hydronium ion over the concentration of the acid. Remember, that water is not included because it's a liquid and their concentration, solids and liquids, remains pretty constant. There you go. Also remember with equilibrium constants, we learned some trends. Now if Ka is a lot greater than one, does that favor products or reactants? Good, that favors products. And if it favors products, that means that the acid's very willing to donate its proton. So if you have something that has a considerably high Ka value, then you're looking at a strong acid. On the other hand, if you have a Ka less than one, then this favors reactants. And that would be typical of an acid that really wants to hold on to its proton. It wants to stay in this form here, and those would be considered weak acids, which is the majority of the acids we will be working with together. Now the table below shows you a list of the six strong acids that you will need to learn. That includes these three binary acids, hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, and hydroiodic acid, and these three oxy acids, nitric acid, perchloric acid, and sulfuric acid, which is a diprotic acid. And at the end of these series of videos on acids and bases, I will cover polyprotic acids. Make sure that you learn this table here. Because if you recognize you have an acid that you're working with, but it's not one of these acids, then you can assume it's 
a weak acid. So rather than learn all the weak acids, it's a lot easier to learn the strong acids and assume that the other acids are just weak. All right, so what happens if we have a one molar hydrochloric acid solution? What is the hydronium ion concentration? And that's gonna be kind of a big question we ask ourselves throughout um, these videos because knowing the hydronium ion we'll learn in a future video allows us to calculate the pH, which is allows us to determine if the solution is acidic, basic, or neutral. All right, first question you should always ask yourself, what's in my beaker when? Right? When we put hydrochloric acid, we recognize that it's one of the strong acids. And strong acids completely dissociate or ionize in solutions. I can draw my beaker and draw what's hanging out in solution. It fully dissociates into those hydronium ions and those chloride anions. They're hydrated by water, so that's why I'm writing aqueous next to them, understanding that's what's taking place. Also, then I can write down a reaction. So, writing down arcs and doing a rice table, although we'll learn that's not really necessary for the strong acids, but for consistency's sake, right? <laughs> so, HCl hydrochloric acid's my acid, water's acting as a base. This looks a lot like HA, right? So that hydrogen, that proton will be donated. We will form the hydronium ion. And then the conjugate base of hydrochloric acid looks like this, but with Cl, it's called the chloride anion. Plus the hydronium ion here. All right. So just to point out again, you can see how this equation looks very similar to that general acid ionization equation. This is kind of a pattern you can learn and fully understand and apply it to other acids more specifically. Now, if we did do a rice table, then our initial concentration of hydrochloric acids, one molar, we didn't add any products in initially. And whenever you have a liquid or a solid and you're doing a rice table in the future, just put a bar through it and say like, we're not, we're not considering this. This does not affect anything at equilibrium. So we don't consider the water when we're doing the rice table. Now remember that C stands for change. How does this change over time? Basically what happens when I add that hydrochloric acid into my beaker, right? We understand as a strong acid, it completely ionizes. So it's only ions. So over time, this HCl is gonna change by minus X plus X plus X. Remember the change, had, we have to take into account the stoichiomet stoichiometry. So everything is minus one X plus one X plus one X here. But due to complete dissociation, X ends up being one, right? One molar. So basically, this is saying minus one. Here we're saying plus one and plus one here. So our final concentrations at the end, if we were hypothetically at equilibrium, which in this case we're not, um, but in the end we have zero amount of HCl that's still intact. We have one molar of chloride ions and one molar of hydronium ions in solution. So the answer to this question is that the hydronium ion concentration is equal to one molar for this one molar hydrochloric acid solution because it completely broke up. And the trend is that if you have a strong acid, then you have, or it's a strong monoprotic acid here, then the concentration of the hydronium ions is equal to the concentration of the acid. So no rice table is needed for strong acids at all. You can just use the trick that hydronium ions equal to the acid concentration for monoprotic, monoprotic
strong acids. All right, so no rice table actually needed there due to complete dissociation. Whereas with weak acids, remember we only have partial dissociation or ionization. All right, so hydrofluoric acid is actually considered to be a weak acid. And we can see here what's in our beaker right? That when we put the HF in there, some of the HF molecules are still intact. So you have the space filling models here, and then you actually have the structures here. Some do ionize, so we do see some fluoride and some hydronium ions in solution, but not full dissociation like you would see with hydrochloric acid. Why is that? We talked about this in our video on binary acids. The fact that hydrofluoric acid is a weak acid despite the fact that fluorine is extremely electronegative, um, is because HF has a strong bond. It has a really high bond strength. So it dissociates less easily. And so we can represent that once again using that general acid ionization equation derived at the beginning of the video. So HF with water. Now, because it's a weak acid, we need to make sure we use the correct arrows. So the double-headed arrows, we will be in equilibrium here. And then this hydrofluoric acid is a proton donor Therefore, water in this case is acting as a base, as the proton acceptor. We end up with the conjugate base of hydrofluoric acid, which is fluoride, and the conjugate acid of water, which gained a proton and turned into that hydronium ion. We can derive the Ka expression here. Remember, that's always products over reactants. So the concentration of fluoride times the concentration of the hydronium ion over the concentration of hydrofluoric acid. And we can look up the Ka value in literature. A lot of these will be um, in the literature at 25 degrees Celsius. And we find that the value is 3.5 times 10 to the negative fourth. Remember, equilibrium constants are given as unitless. All right, the fact that this equilibrium constant is so small, it's so less than one, gives you an indication that you're working with the weak acid, that the equilibrium has shifted far to the left, and you have more reactants in your beaker than you do products. That HF does not want to let go of that proton, does not want to donate it, making it a weaker acid than, let's say, for example, hydrochloric acid. So we can quantify the strength of the acid using Ka values, right? And so the larger the Ka, the stronger the acid, because that means the equilibria is shifted to the right. Let's say you have a Ka lot greater than one. However, Ka values are usually in scientific notation. You're either working with really small numbers or really large numbers here. So instead of using Ka values to quantify acid strength, we often at times express acid strength in terms of pKa. And the formula you should learn here is that pKa is equal to the negative log of Ka. pKa is equal to the negative log of a Ka. And when we look at the data table on the next page here, 
we can look at the Ka values versus the pKa values. And notice how the pK values are just like these nice numbers that you can um, you can maybe wrap your head a little bit better around. I know I you know can for sure. I don't have to think about orders of magnitude small or large orders of magnitude. Just have to compare, oh, 3.34 to 1.96. So it's just an easier way to quantify the acid strength. The trend here is that the lower the pKa, the stronger the acid. The lower the pKa, the stronger the acid. That's going to be your mantra throughout this chapter. Um, so, and you can also verify that. So here we see the pKa is really small, whereas the pKa is really high here for phenol. But the Ka value here is a lot closer to 1 than the Ka value is for phenol. Um, so just using these numbers allows us to see like which one is a stronger acid relative to another acid. Now understand, these are all weak acids, right? You can see that by the equilibria arrows. These are not strong acids. Chlorous acid is not on that list of strong acids, the six strong acids that you need to learn. They're considered weak acids, but we can now see you know, the strength of their acidity relative to one another. Right? And if you go on to take, for example, organic chemistry, you would start studying more of these aromatic molecules and have a better understanding why, why phenol is considered such a weak acid in comparison to something like formic acid. And you would investigate the structure of the conjugate base produced and its stability in order to answer that question. Um, but for right now in my course, um, second semester general chemistry is all about doing data analysis. Um, and so we will utilize these Ka values and these pKa values um, to answer a lot of the questions that we have regarding these acids um, and to work problems. No need to memorize them in my class. Some faculty will have students memorize pKa values of families of compounds and whatnot, like alcohols typically have a pKa of around 16 and you know phenols are around 10. And so I'm not gonna have you memorize that. I would provide that data that you needed, um, the Ka values and the pKa values to um, answer your questions. All right, thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time.